That was Midnight with Escape the Grave. And we've got Mark from Psychonaut on the line. How you going, Mark? Good, Ben. Yourself? Yeah, good, man. Good. Um, Just off air, you were saying this uh, This is the first live interview you've done for 13 years. That's pretty wild, man. Yeah, 13, 12. You know, after like 10, it becomes a blur of the years. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, so I'm happy not to be in a cold, freezing, you know, pissed, urine-smelling phone box. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the luxury it. of my home office on a phone. So, yeah, I appreciate the offer too. No, no worries, man. Appreciate your time. Um, well, uh, you guys have been around forever, 1996. Um, how did it all start, man? Uh, pretty much. It could be 96. It could be 1896. <laughs> I think at that point, you know, like grunge was still happening and also new metal sort of starting to come in. Bands like Corn and all that, you know, were trying trying to take off, well, starting to take off, I should say. Yeah. And then some of these kind of genres weren't sort of my thing, so I thought I need to just stick to what I like doing. And you know, I finally found a good couple of guys I've known for a few years, and we'd end up in rehearsal rooms sometimes for like nine, ten hours. Mm. Everyone's chain smoking, drinking beer, doing other stuff, yeah. and you wouldn't leave there till like four a.m. and um, but just a good little breeding ground for ideas. And there was no set thing like, oh, let's put together a speed metal band or a gothic band or a power metal or, what, you know, or whatever it is. Just did whatever sort of came out. And, you know, I think over the years I've always touted our, our music as being like an A to Z of my favourite album collection. You know, my favourite moments. Yeah. You know, and just filtered through me and obviously through the other guys, so... Rather than just say, "Hey, let's put this uniform on and only play this style," oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. So, mm. yeah, I was going to ask you. Um, so many bands break up over that long amount of time, but you guys have uh, stood the test of time. What do you reckon that is? Some things are hard to give up. Yeah. And you know, look, put it this way: all these years later, even though Psychonauts only put out two albums, and you know, I was in other bands previously, so it was always there's always another thing, another project or another distraction. And, but it's just something you start off and you never know how long it's going to go for. And, you know, fast forward to, say, 25, 26 late, years later, whatever it is, um, even though we're not as prolific and I'm the only kind of original guy left, it's just hard not to do it, you know, even though it's not as not as busy as what we used to be years ago. Um yeah, you just some things you just can't stop doing, you know. Yeah, no, nothing wrong with that, man. That's cool. It's like jerking off, you know. When you <laughs> yeah. go to eighty or ninety years old, geez, I hope my mum's not listening to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, that's it, man. You can't give it up. If man. you got the will, you know, you'll find any way. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you guys have played as a Sabbath cover band recently, and you got the Motorhead cover gig coming up. So they're Correct. absolute greats, man. Are there any bands the three of you have yet to play a full cover set of that you'd really be keen to do? Mm, we've talked about doing Celtic Frost. Nice, yeah. Um, three pieces, pretty good because you got one instrument per, you know, per band member. And uh, obviously, you know, there's a few bands that have two or three bass players or two or three drummers at the same time. Sometimes when you have an extra guitarist, it's good. It takes the pressure off and adds fourth dimension but when you're a three-piece you kind of you know you're a bit more naked that way especially as a guitarist and doing vocals at the same time mm. so we try and pick bands which is which are not so much easy to do but a challenge because when you i guess it's like being in a movie where you know you got to pay play somebody who's a you know a figure and you know like a biopic i guess they call it yeah. i guess being in tribute bands like that but these are not tribute bands as in the regard of getting dressed up you know like a you know fancy dress party type thing it's more about the celebration of the music mm. but when you're up there say doing the motorhead thing or black sabbath and barking out somebody else's lyrics you know those lyrics have come from somebody else's mind and other people's experiences and you know things that they've experienced in their own time so um you were trying trying to do them justice but at the same time put in your own attitude as if you wrote these songs yeah 
you know, it's a long way around to a basic answer, which is because we love doing it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. We did the – we started the sabotage back in probably 2008, I think it was. Derek from – used to do the RTR metal program, Derek Thomas, and uh, he was doing the one that was out in the middle of nowhere, the caravan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway, for a fundraiser. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so – and to do that back then, you know, it was really good fun and yeah. And now we've started the motorhead thing. I actually did the motorhead thing back in 2007. Mm-hmm. We did a couple of shows and, um, but yeah, it's, it's time consuming learning other people's music and to do it faithfully. But, you know, if you dig it and, you know, it's not a chore, you know, it's, it's fun. And these are songs we've known in our heads for years, you know, so it's not like we're learning stuff that we've never heard before. Yeah. And also to be in a band where it's three bands in one, it's pretty good, you know. Mm. All we have to do is just put a logo on a, if, on the same photo, different logo on the same photo, and we're good. Ah, that's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. Don't uh, ask me for any short answers. <laughs> I don't want any short, <laughs> short ones, man. That's all right. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there any chance, just this, a personal thing, any chance of a Wasp show? Well, we did that. Um, as part of one of these LA Xmases at uh, Rocket Room, gosh, the, uh, let's say 2014, for example, mm. 2015. Yeah. We did it, but um, it's pretty harsh on the vocals. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah because Blackie there. Lawless, you know, Wasp were one of my favourite bands, mm. you know, ever since I was a teenager in, you know, early 80s. Yeah. And he's got that uh, black metal type voice. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a screech in there. It's like... And Axl Rose, Brian Johnson, uh, mixed with I'm trying to think of someone, the guy from Marduk, for example, you know that type of style, you know. Yeah. And yeah, you can't just wake up one morning and do it. <laughs> so, and we we did it in the same tuning as them, and I think we got through a few songs and live. I think yeah, it was just starting to shred me, you know. So if you're offering to put your hand up to be the vocalist for it. <laughs> You're hired. Yeah. I wish, mate. No one wants to hear me try that. <laughs> but there's a few other guys around town, you know, like Chris from Vanadium. I think he's got a, you know, a cool enough voice to be able to pull off. So when I see him next, I'll have a chat with him. Yeah, that'd be good. Cool. Um, mm. I read that you guys have, uh, your third album's been in production since mid-2020. Any news on that one? In production since mid 2020, I read on your... Uh, 2013. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. It's, like I said earlier, it's just you get distracted with other things that come in your life. And and because, you know, we're not a full-time band touring the world like some of the big the big shots are, yeah. you know, which is their job, you know, a few a small percentage of people get through, you know, and, you know, the rest of us, we've got jobs and families and all sorts of shit that goes along with it. So, yeah. Um, Plus, the last album we did, Shock 'em Dead, it's jam packed with all sorts of. There's so many little things in there that are hidden, you know. And even now, I listened to it the other night, relearning a few solos and stuff like that. I sitting on headphones, I was like, shit, did I really put that in there? And, you know. So that took quite a while because it's not about being fussy or trying to nail everything perfect, but I'm trying to capture a moment in time. Yeah. I put that on an album. But, you know, how long is a moment in time? You know, mm-hmm. five five years yeah. <laughs> you know four years yeah. and plus we've all got you know half ass home studios now so you know it's i'll get to it one day I'll get to it one day you know yeah but if you go into a studio where you're paying you know five four hundred to five hundred bucks a day you know you have to have your shit to get together and things are going to get done quicker you know yeah. but i just think i don't know it's not i don't know if i'm lazy it's just that once i get a starting point then i go with it you know, mm-hmm. then, but you know, again, like I said, when you got jobs and you got other stuff you got to do, you can't spend a good month doing this every day because you run out of time. You know, so I think we just record when, well, from my point of view, when I get the time and the inspiration to do. It. And you know, I could lie in bed and know the songs in my head. I can hear it already without having any headphones on. Mm. So I know how it's got to come out. I just got to kind of. Stick a USB B cable in the back of my head into my computer. Yeah. Download it. Yeah, that'll be so much easier. So, 
it's on its way. You know, the, most of the drum tracks are done and some bass and, you know, I've already done quite a lot of uh, rhythm guitar and stuff like that. And obviously the vocals for me take the longest, you know, but everything's written and all arranged. And over the years, you know, we've played at least 60% of these songs, mm-hmm. gosh, even up to for nearly 10 years. So, you know, it's about transferring that onto an album. And also doing those songs live gives you a chance to develop them, to feel, to feel them out and see what works and what doesn't. Yeah. You know, so look, just hang in there. And I'm talking to myself about that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. Yeah. laughs> I want to hear it just as much as, you know, yeah. anyone else, I guess. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we talked about some of your influences, but I uh, think in way back, do you remember what was sort of the first, uh, first band or first album that really got you pumped about? metal and playing this kind of stuff probably i would say kiss nice, yeah. you know being a kid in the 70s and you know having two older sisters who are into bands like kiss and what other crap was around like um bay city rollers and you know whatever i don't know hmm. things like that and we used to hear slade and obviously acdc and things like that mm-hmm. but i think it was probably more kiss because it's like, you know, if you're from that Kiss Star Wars generation, you're seeing these things for the first time. It has a huge impact on you. For bands like Kiss, you know, back then it, it was kind of beyond human, mm. you know. And uh, I'm looking at a block amount I've, I've got here in my office of Kiss Love Gun, just looking at it there, yeah. thinking it's almost this superhero, you know. You've heard all the cliches about Kiss in the past. So it was probably that and just the kind of, you know, end up, as you go through teenagehood and puberty and you start to become like this hairy teenager, like you're a werewolf and, you know, you start getting horny and you start to understand the, the lyrics, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. You know, especially the Gene Simmons side of it and all that stuff. And yeah, I, I think I became obsessed with Kiss, not just for that, but just kind of just the attitude and, and also in the early eighties, you know, Kiss, wasn't popular in Australia anymore. So it was good to feel like a bit of a, um, outcast or an underground metal head, you know, because the school I went to, there was a couple of other guys there. So we went to an all boys school and, um, a couple of them went to kiss. And then all of a sudden, you know, kid brings a, this is a Catholic school. Kid brings a twisted sister record to school. So you meet up in the dunny to have a look at it and read the lyrics yeah. because it, one of the priests or the brothers or whoever they are catches you with it you, you might as well be shooting up or you know <laughs> yeah. smoking a cigarette now something it's the same crime mm-hmm. and yeah, things like that you know probably judas priest um definitely slayer when i first heard because it used to be a radio program you probably remember gods of thunder yeah of course yeah yeah from 6 uvsfm and again i can remember being like 14 15 waiting for that to come on on a thursday night and you know, recording a lot of it, you know, and because of um, shows like that, they were a pipeline, you know, mm. for heavy metal music. And then we had Twilight Records in town, right? The only um, heavy metal emporium. And then all of a sudden, you know, us to wag school and go and hang out there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then just be this, you know, kid who's got a few zits on his face and wearing a Twisted Sister t-shirt under a school uniform and, you know, you think, you, you think you're think you in one of these 80s metal, metal videos, you know what I mean? Mm. Oh, and um, so really good influence like that and um, I should say corrupt, corrupting influence. <laughs> and, you know, I always treasure moments like that and, you know, not a day goes by when I don't think about something from back then, you know, because even though I'm much older now. I'm still got that 15, 16 year old kid mentality. Yeah, that's good then. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's important, you know, you can explore other things, but the first couple of bands you got into, they're always going to be stuck there for life. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's not like I've had mates, you know, you grow up together type of thing and, you know, you go into your 20s and, you know, you go out at nightclubs and stuff like that, and then you see them years later, and they go, are you still into the heavy metal shit? It's like, yeah. It's not like a pair of jeans I grew out of, or, <laughs> you know. Well, what are you listening to? And they'll reel off names like, I don't know, Jamaraquai or Billie Eilish or, you know, something that's fucking intelligent. 
<laughs> I wouldn't go as so far to say Billie Eilish was intelligent. Yeah, well, but, yeah. that's it. You know, heavy metal sarcasm. <laughs> and so the thing, yeah, the thing is that, um, yeah, it's stuck with you. Mm. We're stuck with it. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, oh, absolutely, man. It's great. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's funny, you know, you say Kiss seem inhuman. I saw them um, last time they were in Perth, which is, you know, mm. they're definitely, they're certainly not in their prime or anything, but they still came down on a mechanical spider and, you know, flying on fly, fly, flying foxes. It's still pretty, you know, out there, even though we've mm. seen it for a long time, they've still got something, you know. And that's the thing, yeah, but these days, um, you know, these bands are huge, massive conglomerates. It's a massive business and, you know, they employ a lot of people, you know, Rolling Stones the same. Any big band, Metallica. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody that's touring around, every time they go into a major city, there's employment. There's all sorts of shit, you know. And but yeah, Kiss these days is kind of like, yeah, look, they should have stopped twenty years ago. <laughs> yeah, you know? I suppose, I suppose. Okay, you know, and I was like near the front there somewhere, cheap tickets. Mm. You know, I mean, cheap's like under a hundred bucks. Yeah, and. Yeah, you know, it's good to be amongst all the big spectacle and stuff like that, and Kiss have been known for that, but it's a bit like going to watch David Copperfield where there's a lot of illusions going on and, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, he's kind of singing, but, you know, it looks a bit out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah. jumping around and, you know, Paul Stanley's making out with himself and, you know, <laughs> he's almost reproducing with himself on stage. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure the guy's made out of guitar picks, you know. <laughs> So there's all these things, you know, you think this is kind of cool at the same time. It's like, oh, I don't know. It's have some dignity. Look at Led Zeppelin when um, John Bonham died, they stopped. Yeah. Obviously different band, different attitude, but yeah, you know, I think, but it's the nostalgia that keeps us all interested. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, that's if they actually make it here in October, I'll be going again despite all that. And that's you know? the thing. Yeah. You know, like, no one ever says to an actor, hey, you're too old to, you know, be an actor. So when it comes to musicians, especially hard rock and heavy metal, which has more or less been seen by, you know, the average Joe as being, you know, immature, or, ah, that's stupid, all that crap, you know. It's like, it's supposed to be a young man's game, but, you know, <laughs> you got guys, Gene Simmons, like, 71, 72, you know, still dragging his fat ass up on stage. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, every time he sweats, it's like, you know, he's just made a million bucks. <laughs> yeah. So if there's still people there willing to go and pay to watch him and, you know, he's still able to, phew, why not keep playing? Yeah, it's all right, man. Yeah. So it's – there are certain stigmas attached to um, different occupations in life. And, you know, it's like people, you know, like the wrestling – if Hulk Hogan came back out or, you know, did a tour, people would still go and watch him, you know. They would, yeah. It's because it's a nostalgic thing. But if you squint, you squint, you know, from a certain distance in the audience, I think, gosh, this is just like, you know, 30 years ago. But then when you open eye, your eyes up, yeah, they're old, everyone's old. But, you know, as long as, you, you know, the person next to you is smiling and having fun, reeking off booze and, you know, dope, it's, you know, it's fun. Yeah, oh, for sure. Man. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of speaking of booze, um, we got the big sleigh fest thing this Saturday. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yep. So, we um, I think we we didn't play the first one, then we played the next one. When was that? 2019. Yes, yeah. yeah, 2019. I think we played just after Phil Phil Anselmo. Oh, ah, yep. And while he was playing, there was about. Ten people in the room. So, like, oh, shit, we're going to get shafted here. Um, actually, that's wrong information. I'm thinking about something else. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, what? What? what no, what the crowd. That's right. We, yeah. we. Sorry, we were setting up. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, right. I think Deathlehem were playing while Anselmo was on. Uh, look, it was a long night, mate. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> so, yeah, after he played. Was it before? Shit, what'd you ask me this question for? <laughs> Sorry, mate. <laughs> Look, um, we're looking forward to it because, you know, we haven't played together since we did a few, uh, wedding, I should say. I nearly said funeral. We did a wedding last <laughs> October yeah. at Psychonaut, which is pretty good fun. But 
this would be a chance to get back out there and you know these shows are always pretty big over here you know all these monsters of rock tribute shows as well so it's more or less the same dudes involved and the good thing about slave fest is that um you know they do a lot of promotion they put a lot of effort into it and you know because we're lucky over here that we can still go out and do all this shit yeah that's you know, right. compared to other states or other parts of the world so i think this is why um people really enjoy it mm. you know and i live i live in the country now so it's not like i can just drive up to perth and rehearse every week and so i have to kind of really tr- treasure and cherish these moments <laughs> <laughs> you know on these on these you know big, big stages in perth and so yeah we're pumped for it and we'll probably play a few old songs as well oh beautiful that's more sarcasm. Everything we play <laughs> is fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we do have it, like, um, on the set list for this show, uh, I wrote a song about Pete Steele. Oh, yeah. Okay. The idea was to write a song. It was to write a song that Typo Negative was trying to write a Black Sabbath song type thing. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just a conceptual thing mm-hmm. about Pete Steele who's been – you know, in this tomb for years and years, loosely based on their song Suspended in Dusk. Okay. It's about the vampire. So, but I put Pete Steele in that situation. And, um, yeah, it's pretty good. It's got big and doomy. There's a big fast section in the middle and it goes back to the doom section. So they followed, you know, Black Sabbath, you know, some of their formats every now and then. So. Mm. But it's just a bit of a tribute, and the idea was because he was in Playgirl magazine, right? Yeah. You know, um, everyone's going to go rush to their covers now to see who's got a copy of it. <laughs> rush to eBay. The world's longest centerfold. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, the idea was I wanted to call it heavier than Pete's steel, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But trying to weave that into the chorus, I'm still working on it. So. Uh. Uh, yeah, so other songs from Shock I'm Dead, a couple from the first album, Masters of Procrastination. So Yeah, nice. Like, I've right. got a million song ideas. It's just getting around to sort of ugh, develop, developing them, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, that's good, man. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we're going to play one now uh, from a few years back, uh, Steamroller. Thanks, Steamroller, Steve. yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks, Steve, for your time, Mark. It's good chat. And, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing you Saturday, yeah? Thanks, Ben. And I wanted to, um, you know, acknowledge Stevie Vella, who was our original bass player, because he wrote the lyrics for this. Nice. Yeah, based on that uh, Spielberg movie, Duel. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, all right. Let's let's make sure that we catch up on um, Saturday night. It is Saturday, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure, (laughs) mate. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) My life's a blur at the moment. (laughs) Thanks, Ben. I I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who's um, kind of – Sent me messages every now and then. When are we going to release something? And, you know, it's kind of, I don't know. I, I appreciate the um, the two or three emails I get per year from fans. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, it's more than I'm getting, mate. <laughs> All right, here we go. Psychonaut with Steamroller. Cheers, man. Cheers, mate. Thanks. <laughs> Keep on.